Hello, my name is Darnell Jamal. Uh, I'm a fashion historian, uh, as well as an education coordinator here at Cooper Hewitt. I also served as the project curatorial assistant on the Willie Smith Street Couture exhibition that's open and out now that you can come to Cooper Hewitt if you're in New York and come see it now that the now that Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum is open. Um, and then also in accordance, I, I have a more, I don't know if I have a chiseled face, but I have a Caesar, uh, Caesar haircut, um, brown dark skin, um, as well as I'm wearing a snakeskin blazer and a leather with a leather lapel. Um, just to be even more specific, in a black shirt. Uh, but that said, thank y'all so much out here for, for, for tuning in to Fashion Culture Futures. And before we begin, I kind of want to take a moment just to thank everyone who has been a part of this and who has helped us uh, get this together. Uh, shout out to Alexandra, uh, which who, uh, who I will be forever grateful for allowing me to join her on the Willie Smith Street Couture Project. Um, in the online archive that I also welcome you all to visit to learn more about Willie Smith, just in case you can't come out to uh, Cooper Hewitt to see the exhibition. Um, and shout out also to Julie Pastor, who was also marvelous in helping to create, to tell Willie Smith's uh, obscure story and his impact in design. Um, I also wanna thank uh, the communications team, also the education team, Vaso and Kim and everyone who's behind the scenes, um, putting all of this together and making this come to life. Um, thank you all so much. I really appreciate this. And we all just are just so elated to be here. Um, with that said, as you notice, the title of this program, Aesthetics of Freedom, Hypervisibility of Modest and Queer Fashions, uh, these communities are the focus. But I want to use this moment to highlight how much in a broad sense, some commonality, there are some commonalities between the worlds, these worlds, while celebrating our differences. Uh, for this program, I plan to explore a variety of themes as it pertains to these two communities and their intersections within uh, fashion from an industry and historical and contemporary perspective. Uh, modest fashion and style birth from queer experiences have been historically excluded uh, by social and political codes and misappropriated by the broader fashion system. Uh, within this conversation, uh, exploring ways these systemic pitfalls have been creatively combated, the themes of the discussion will move from spirituality, uh, policing and censoring, misappropriation and tokenism, and liberation. And uh, before we begin into the conversation, I'd like to introduce my two guests that you can see here, uh, one of which is Ashani. During her career as a photographer and creative director, uh, Shani founded Uma Models after realizing uh, the lack of diversity in modest clothing and representation in the fashion in the fashion industry and media, despite the vast consumer market. The need for nakedness isolated many communities. Shani works in her career to make a safe space for women within the fashion industry, allowing them to pursue a career in fashion modeling uh, without compromising personal or religious beliefs. And thank you so much, Shani, for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this today. I'm excited to be here, yeah, thank you. Of course. And my other guest, I have the incredible artist, Brendan Fernandez, who worked with us also in the Willie Smith Street Couture Project. He uh, wrote a piece called Future Crossings for the book. Um, and also we, we, we decided to integrate that uh, also on the Willie Smith uh, Community Online Archive that again, that you can find online. Uh, Brendan Fernandez is an international artist, uh, internationally recognized Canadian artist currently based in Chicago, working at the intersection of dance and visual arts. His projects address issues of race, queer uh, culture, migration, uh, protests and other forms of collective movement and are rooted in collaboration and foster solidarity. Uh, Brendan is a graduate of the Whitney Independent Study Program and a recipient of a Robert Rauschenberg Fellowship. In 2010, he was shortlisted for the Sobe Art Award uh, and is the recipient of a prestigious 2017 uh, Canada Council New Chapters Grant. He's also the recipient of the Artadia Award, a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, and a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Grant. 
His projects have uh, shown at the 2019 Whitney Biennial, the Guggenheim Museum, MoMA, Getty Museum, uh, the National Gallery of Canada, among others. He's currently in an artist in resident uh, and assistant professor at Northwestern University and is represented by uh, the Monique Meloc, Meloc Gallery. Hi, Brendan. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much. Um, super generous and I'm so grateful for this conversation to be had. Thank you, thank you both so much. This has been uh, definitely a labor of love, but um, here we are. And I really want to kind of kick it off and going into spirituality. You know, here I want to guide the conversation to illuminate the role of spirituality and religious codes uh, that inform dress. And I also want to dispel the misnomers about elements of style in each community. Cause I think that it's out there that uh, with queer experiences and uh, particularly modest fashion, especially when you're talking about the Muslim experience, there's a lot of uh, misnomers and, and, and misguided perspectives about both and what they bring to the table. Um, and for you, Shani, you know, unequivocally, when we're looking at modest fashion, particularly as it pertains to the Muslim experience of which you can speak towards, what, what, what do you find are those misnomers uh, about fashion and this intersection, especially as it ties with spiritual faith? Um, yeah, so I, th uh, I think the biggest issue we have at the moment uh, within the media, within the industry, um, is the label that we have for these um the women that decide to model um calling them muslim models mm -hmm. so like that's the the biggest problem um as we have a lot of um other women of different faiths that model and their faiths are not put forward as the title of what they do um instead i've been trying to push like my company has been trying to push for the last like three years um the term modest model rather than having a muslim model um, because modesty, um, there's obviously different levels to it. Uh, and one of those levels does encompass the, um, the Muslim fashion side of it. However, the models themselves shouldn't kind of be labelled as Muslim models um, in the industry. Um, they should be able to have that faith as private, um, as well as it being recognised, you know, through dress. And that's how we do spiritually spiritually through our dress um we recognize our faith um especially when it comes to wearing the head a headscarf um and also i think one one thing is um i think a lot of muslims make this mistake as well as non-muslims um is that we own the headscarf um and we own that item of fashion um which we we don't um so we get a bit offended i think a lot of muslims get offended when they see um uh, fashion shows or or articles or editorials where there's a model that's covering their hair and feels like that's some sort of appropriation on um the kind of muslim fashion but we have to recognize that there's a, there's a certain way that we spiritually wear, there's a certain way that we religiously wear our head garments um that differentiate between um, you know, being a head, a head covering and a religious head covering, you know. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, issues there that are, um, be, that are, not, that are not, not understood. I don't think the conversation's really being had. I feel a few people try to have it, but the, the ones that matter, unfortunately, when it comes to having those displayed, that conversation never had about the religious levels of um, fashion and mm -hmm. the differentiation between head coverings and um, say Islamic fashion kind of thing. Um, yeah. And that's interesting because you brought up the point that there is this kind of um, like people visually uh, melt the two together when they're very different. And I'm curious to know what does respect look like for you in the fashion industry and for those who are similar experiences, you know, from a practical, you know, business standpoint, as well as from a personal standpoint? I think asking questions is respectable. Um, I think that's the, the best thing you can do. If you haven't done your research yourself as like 
um, an artist, a designer, uh, um, a, a director of a set. Um, if you've not done the, the research yourself, then ask them the questions, um, asking the, so when it comes to people, my clients, they come to me first of all, I'm the first, of, uh, first point of call. And I often tell them what the, the models can and can't do. Um, but that's not that they've asked more, more time more than I've told them what it is. So I think um, asking questions is really important um, and, and having genuine, a genuine want to understand, you know, like what modest fashion mm -hmm. is and the different levels of modest fashion. Because mm -hmm. at the moment I'm talking just obviously from a... Um, the Muslim point of view, but it's such a broad, um, it's such a broad in, um, I'm so sorry, my words are just a bit skewed today. It's, no, it's no such worries. A, um, it's, it's so broad, like modesty right. is really subjective um, mm -hmm. to the individual. Um, and we've not really defined what modest fashion is. I think that's the biggest issue um, that the, the mainstream industry has because there's no definition and they haven't asked what the definition is. They've kind of just run with a little bit of this, a little bit of that. When um, the people that are modest, mm -hmm. they recognize the limits of modest fashion and there is limits on it. Even though it's quite broad, we've got you know, um, certain ways of dressing that come under the bracket of being modest. So, And I think also uh, with, within that space, like you know, Islam modesty is seen as being oppressive. And yeah. that's a fear that we've, we've built around, you know, a culture. And that is not a thing. And it's, you know, you have, uh, a hijab is something that is a choice. It's not an oppression. And so that's one thing that's really important. But also the idea of it being fashion is also different. And in that space, this exhibition that was at the Cooper Hewitt gave a space to show that it cannot just be oppression. It shows it as something different. And there's a choice there. And I think that's a really important thing because in, in our greater culture, we create fears against each other. You know, like you don't understand my culture, so I don't know you, so I'm fearful of you. And it's like, don't fear me, know me, learn about me, learn about my culture. And that's exactly what you're saying, Shani. And so I'm so grateful for that. No, and I, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, what, um, back in 2018, I think it was, we had like a big issue with Vogue reposting one of our models um, from um, a modest fashion show that we had in London. Um, reposted one of our models who actually wasn't in the show. She was just outside. Absolutely stunning girl, mashallah. And she had um, a headscarf on and the comments were in the thousands of thousands of people asking Vogue, why have you got this woman on here? The statement of oppression and yeah. So it was really like an, a lack of understanding from people. And like you said, a fear, definitely. So um, I think it's up to the people that are in the mainstream industry to kind of, if you're going to put it out there, then represent it correctly as well as, um, as well as explaining what it is instead of hiding it, you know? And of I just, course. Yeah. I definitely think, yeah, so thank and, you. And, and again, grateful for what you're doing in your, in your world, uh, because fashion is, is not easy. Um, you're doing the work for us uh, to make us visible, you know, like whatever that means. Again, like, you know, like <clears throat> Muslims, like women, uh, cis, queers, whatever, like it, it, you're, you're giving a visibility and that's really important. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> and also uh, for all of you out there, the, the exhibition that they're mentioning is Contemporary Muslim Fashion, which is also here on view at uh, Cooper Hewitt um, on the third floor. And, and I don't, on the top of my head, I do not know <laughs> when it is closing, but it is closing soon. Um, but if you're again in New York um, within the next month, I encourage you to, to see it and actually travel uh, uh, from the San Francisco Museum of Fine Arts uh, entity out, uh, out west. Um, and I, it's an interesting point that you brought up, Brendan, about you know, the idea of fear that was instilled, historically instilled, to, to, to kind of create the perceptions around how we see 
uh, these different intersections. And for Willie Smith, um, you know, he was also fighting against that as well, you know, being a Black queer man um, in an industry, in a world that didn't necessarily celebrate him in the way that he should have been. Um, and so I, 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 I'm, there was a piece, there was a, 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 a section of your chapter um, that talks a little bit about him de- using spirituality as a way to kind of uh, create his identity, create his aesthetic to almost kind of, ass- not necessarily assimilate, but also, but really to connect to people um, in a way that allowed him to stand out. Um, you wrote, uh, subverting the cliche of cross-border experience with humor may have been exactly what my mother had in mind with her own stylized border crossing. Uh, what we can take from these images is that self-presentation changes our claim to space. Smith's per- spectacular Willie Wear runway shows created space for individual expression, taking street fashions and church tailoring from Harlem to international runways. Smith's ethos created new spaces for the people who wore his collections. And so if you don't mind, I would love to, for you to elaborate specifically <clears throat> on your train of thought through that lens um, as, as pertains to your, also your own life as a, as a, as a queer person. Um, definitely. So I think, you know, first and foremost, like Willie Smith for me is someone who made work in his vein um, of, of supporting hybridity, um, being many things, uh, which I also identify with. Um, but when you know, I think about like fashion and what he did with fashion, I think about, you know, if you want to talk about narratives, my family, you know, we're fifth generation Kenyan born Indians. So mixed hybrid or pretty intersectional there. But like the idea of clothing was something that we didn't have privilege to have. And so my grandmother made us clothes. And in that space of making us clothes, we felt empowered. We felt like we were taking over the space of oppression. You know, we were living in a space of a, I grew up in post-colonial space. They, and again, whatever that means, but Mm -hmm. like my um, parents lived in apartheid. You know, they weren't allowed to be, you know, intersectional. So, but clothing gave them power. Um, and so maybe it looked like West, it was Westernized clothing, but within that, like, we were like, and I think I said this to like um, in the essay uh, that we were like the Von Trapp family where like our, our, my grandmother made us dress the same. Like we all looked like in a uniform mm-hmm. and a uniform is also a very political thing. And, you know, like I love wearing certain kinds of like clothing that makes me feel like I'm in a uniform because I can make it my make it my own, but I can still be part of a community. And a community is really important to build a space of community, to build a space of inclusivity. And so when we talk about queerness, that's it. It's not about a gendered space. It's not about a sexual space for me. Queerness is about community. If you fit into my community, we break fractures. We break those ideas of what is not, I, 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 we all have our struggles. Like, you know, mm-hmm. we all have our struggles. We're dealing with them. But if we can all be together and deal with them together, that's an important space. And so I think within fashion and what really did, I think a lot about those ideas of like being inclusive and making it like grow within ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. And I think that we'll get to the point of liberation towards the end. And I feel like for both of you um, through fashion, that reclamation and liberation um, can, it is really kind of achieved um, in, in your own ways. Um, but next, I, I really wanna kind of move into policing and censoring and dig a bit into both of your knowledge in various ways, uh, the broader fashion industry systemically limited the respective communities you all uh, hail from and also not only in a, 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 in a abstract way, but also regarding creative output um, and, and, and how they obviously are forms of discrimination and whatnot. Um, and Shani, you know, linking to the original conversation of 
you know, what respect of Muslim bodies look like and, mo- and not even just Muslim bodies, but, but modest, those who identify with the modest fashion category and realm, you know, how have you seen style or physical bodies uh, policed in your work, you know, as an owner of a model management company? Yeah, so um, the policing is crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know what it is? It's because it's so new. I think mm-hmm. uh, the, the label of modest fashion is really new. And um, we have the, we had like the leading model being Halima Arden, who had nobody. Um, so funny enough, one of the first models we ever have, it was a British girl, a girl from London actually, called um, Maria Drissi. She was the first ever uh, Muslim woman to wear a hijab, to be mm-hmm. featured um, in a campaign. Um, so she was the first. And then Halima Arden was, um, America leads with fashion, really. So because she was American in America, this it blew up uh, massively, mm-hmm. more so than um, Maria, Maria Driss's. Um, but because there wasn't anybody in front of Maria, uh, sorry, in front of um, Halima, there was no really way like of anything being paved. And because the industry, the modest fashion industry itself, and even if you look at just the Muslim part of that and the Muslim expenditure there, it's in the billions, we have the mainstream industry just want to be a part of it. So mm-hmm. them just wanting to be a part of it meant that they just want to grab and do everything very quickly rather than doing any research about what modest fashion is or even trying to um, dif- have a differentiation a definition, sorry, of what modest fashion is. And the mainstream industry could have actually done that. They could have actually defined what modest fashion is and then went off there, but they, they hadn't done that. And because they haven't done that, what they um, end up doing is they um, it becomes policing what they think is modest fashion. And it goes completely against what modest fashion is. So for instance, there's a lot of women that don't want to, and, and the thing is modest fashion isn't exclusively for women. So we, we did used to represent men um, within the agency um, of the models, um, but we no longer do because that was overly policed, unfortunately. Um, and men are seemed or deemed to be more modest than women anyway. So there wasn't really a platform for that. There wasn't people wanting to, excuse me, there wasn't really clients uh, coming forward to hire male models through us um, as they didn't see modesty linked with men. So that was one thing with like the men missing out, but we had a lot of men and we still do have a lot of men applying for the, for the agency because they know they want to be in the fashion industry, but they don't want to be over-sexualized within that industry. Um, and that's unfortunately something that happens to men. Um, so they, they, they saw us as an option to go down the modest route to be able to just model without being like over sexualized, you know, um, on catwalks and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, well, you know, like, out. yeah, Brendan, sorry. Sorry, like, you know, I'm a former ballet dancer and like within that space, like, you know, body types, gender types, like, you know, we get like classified as well. Like, you know, so um, I, 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 again, gracious that you're making these, these roles for us in this industry. And, but also it, it like, you know, I, I think about also like the ideas of like, what does modesty mean? Like, yeah. you know, um, I remember crossing a US border and with, you know, all my papers and being told and asked by a person of color, uh, why, what is the purpose of your beard? Okay. Um, and I was like, there's no purpose. Um, but the purpose was asking me if I was Muslim. Again, the idea of fear and I knew the, what the question was asking me. And I said, you know, there's no purpose. Like I have a beard. The person ahead of me had a beard, but no one asked me, no one asked them what that purpose was. So it's, it's like this thing again of like, you know, so again, modesty is an important kind of definition and word we're empowering, but also in that empowerment, why are we giving that space to the other, the one that will call us out? And, and that's something that I really think about. It's like, you know, you can call me out. We're making spaces. I don't want to make that space sometimes. Like, give me that space. And yeah. so it's, it's so again, 
I'm grateful for what we do in our spaces, but it's, it's, it's complicated, you know? Definitely. That's why we had to kind of let go um, of that, unfortunately, the, that kind of realm within the industry, the um, agency, the male modest fashion, is just because it's just not recognised um, yet. It will be. I mean, God willing, it's going to come and it will be. Definitely. Um, and you're doing the, the work. Moment, they're not they're not allowing that space and that's the mainstream that's not allowing that space we have the muslim um, community that have lots of male modest fashion clothing that needs modeled um but because it's such a small community they end up like kind of just using themselves or their friends and families and stuff like that they don't actually tend to go to the agencies to kind of get models for that so it's it's growing for the male side of things um but there's definitely like the police in there of that, you know, of saying, well, actually men don't practice modesty or they're just modest anyway. So we don't really need them in the mainstream. Um, and we really do because we got things like, um, don't have a we, we have the mod the modest community. Um, we can go over and look at the Sikhis, for instance. So the Sikh people, um, mm -hmm. they practice modesty as well. And then we have Gucci in 2018. Yeah. Um, you know, having the runway where they've got non-Sikh people um, wearing the turban. And this mm. is a religious garment. It comes back to, you know, the, mis the misappropriation, the, the the lack of understanding, the lack of the care, the, the, the lack of care. They don't care about these people. What well, it's, and, well and fashion I, is always appropriated. Well, the, and, and the thing is, it's and, not, it doesn't own, we don't, sorry, it doesn't belong to anybody, right? But the thing is, when they do these things, they're directing it to these people. So they want their audience to be. So if you're going to have a, if you're going to have a, a man in a turban, more than likely you're, you're looking to, to aim your clothing at the, the community that wears turbans, right? But then at the same time, you're not representing that community at, at all in any way, shape or form. You've not actually wore the turban properly. You still got your hair hanging out the back and so on and so forth. It just, it just, it's, it's like, what are you trying to do? What is it that's happening? You know, why, Definitely. why? And I also, I, it makes me think about Prada, that Prada did not have, you know, a person of color on their runway for like how many years? And they, you know, it was called the blackout, you know, like we had the blackout. People are not... It was like, you know, a certain kind of aesthetic. And again, when I say ballet, you know, I was not a, the perfect ballet dancer because I was not white enough, like for like lack of better words, you know, like I had the physicality, I had everything else, but I was like these standardizes, you know, and I think that's part of the problem that when we think about, you know, fashion, like, you know, um, and like just life in general as POCs, queerness breaks that down. We need to challenge that and say that as queers, we are making spaces for each other and we are allowing us to be a part of a conversation, a dialogue, a lived space. Like that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. For me, that's what it is. You know, um, I don't want to like say I'm calling out my fellow like you know, other dancers or models or people, but I'm trying to make a, a space where we break down the binaries and we think about like solidarity. Because yeah. if we don't have solidarity, like what are we doing? Like it's like, then we're all just are still fighting against each other. Like it's not a post-colonial space or a colonial space. It's the same space. And I think a lot of people are too scared to speak up about it as well. And speak about like to, sp to speak about it because as soon as you start speaking up about it it looks as if you're being re rebellious and you're against that whereas what you're trying to do is just have your identity and own that um and be allowed to be you in the space that you you want to work in um and one one thing that the, uh, the, the fashion industry lacks are people of color and diversity obviously this is the reason for this conversation um and it lacks the it doesn't lack the people of diversity um, as models and maybe designers or something like that. But it, no, designers definitely as models. Um, but what it does lack is the diversity, the people on the top. You know, the people that are actually calling the shots. Um, the yeah, the ones that are making the actual decisions. They have no what? clue, and then they don't. They don't have any. Um, they they 
they're not diver it's not diverse enough basically yeah so. and i was gonna say then it goes back to the aesthetics and beauty and how we've decided what is beautiful and what is not beautiful yeah. and for me you know there are moments where i've been told all the time that i'm not beautiful and and i'm not the aesthetics that they want and that's something that is a big part of the conversation that we need to challenge yeah. and that's a western ideal of what is beauty and what you're doing by bringing in people into this agency is challenging that and yeah. again for all of us, this is why we're here. It's a thing. And to say you're being told you're not beautiful is a vulnerable thing to say. And to be honest about that is difficult. You know, like, it is. like it's, it's complicated. So something that like kind of gets back to Darnell's question about the police and, and, what, and what you're saying, Brendan, right now is that um, the idea of the traditional hijab that was something that was obviously not seen as beautiful. So, first of all, you're going to call the the you're going to call out the religion of the model that you're using in your campaign, okay? And say this is a Muslim model. By doing that, what you're saying is you want all the other Muslims to know that you can buy from our brand. We cater to you. Um, however, the way that you wear your headscarf religiously doesn't fit what we find beautiful, and then that's when you get the turbans, you get um, the the no longer covering of the neck a bit and no longer covering of the bosom and these are things that we have to do religiously when wearing a headscarf so religiously wearing a headscarf we have um it's in the quran and told to us how we we are supposed to wear our our coverings and it talks about the covering covering your head and your bosom this is no longer something that so this is something that the mainstream doesn't understand or the fashion industry, the fashion houses don't understand, haven't really looked into, but they don't find it beautiful. So they've changed it to fit their clothing. So then what you do there is you isolate the actual people that you really want to be a part of. And also you've got now this Muslim model, who you call Muslim, who's wearing your clothing that you've now labelled as modest clothing, um, posing in provocative positions. Um, or having a headscarf on um, with perhaps inappropriate length of clothing as well to go with that headscarf. But you're so you're not you're not catering to the the audience that you're pretending to cater to. And I think there's a point that we're missing as well with class. Like like class also changes the way that you can dress, um, what you can afford, and how you'll dress. Like you know, and part of the show, like you know is that there's a lot of like, Willie Smith made clothing, streetwear clothes, like that I could just buy a pair of jeans and then like rock it out. But also the exhibition with the, you know, the Islamic um, uh, show, it's like about, it was, some fashion. Glam yeah. it was glamorous. It was like, it was couture. And that's yes. not everyone's way of being. And yeah. I think that that's a big part to think about is like, what is our class? Because um, within this westernized, you know, space of neo-capitalism, we are thinking about things, but we also need to like think about our class and our space and how we make our spaces. And I'm privileged. I'm definitely privileged. You know, I I'm being brought into it. I've made myself privileged, and I will own that privilege. But I think we also need to still be self-reflexive. Yeah. And I think I think for sure, like that's a big space for sure. We, exactly. We had Dolce Gabbana in, what was it, 2016, 2017, um, bring out co a collection for the, the Muslim community, um, being at the headscarves and the, the abayas. And like you said, class-wise, the average Muslim couldn't afford that. And we even had the campaign just recently with Nike. I'm here name-dropping and putting everyone under the bus. <laughs> no, I love, I, love, I, love, okay. I love it. I love the name-dropping. <laughs> Drop more names. Right. But, because, but also, like, they're going to those spaces because they want to make money. They want to make money. And, this is the like, thing, and we think about the it. Emirates. We think about, like, you know, I'll, like, go to the Emirates and I'm, like, you know, also like Vogue, what's it called? It's like Vogue in the Emirates, it's called Vogue. Arabia, um, Vogue Arabia. Arabia, and I'm like, who says Arabia? Yeah. But that's inappropriate, but it's Vogue Arabia. Like, Vogue Arabia. to me, that that seems like, you know, a space of creation that I'm like, you know, 
we're still following these systems of power and hegemony that are trying to create how we understand the way we look, yep. the way we move through spaces, like, like, I mean, physically moving, but it's, 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 we need to like break those down. Like it's definitely, you know, and, and then the, again, the fear, the fear and the oppression. Yeah. And I, I think the oppression definitely comes from the fashion industry when it comes to the modest, um, the, the modest people. Um, just again, to touch on Darnell's point of the policing, um, so, for instance, like I was saying, at Nike, 2019, we did the campaign with them. Um, obviously, very excited to work with Nike at that point. You know, like, oh, we're working with Nike, we're doing it. And they were doing a swimsuit for modest women. Um, but they, they, they aimed it for hijab-wearing women, right? So, he, so it was with their head covering. They could have done both. They could have, like, taken a head covering off and just did the modest. But they chose to do it just for the modest women. And that's perfectly fine. So now you're you're just you targeted the Muslim community by saying we're going to make you a um, um, a swimwear that you can wear. Um, and this is at a time where we've got countries banning burkas and burkinis and all this kind of stuff and like banning religious dress. So we're kind of excited as the Muslim community. And then we see the campaign; it comes out. We're we're really excited, and I'm talking for the community. And then we see the price. And Nike decided to put the price of this swimsuit at, um, I think it was 600 US dollars um, for a swimsuit. And it was about, yeah, 500 um, pounds. And that's not affordable for it. For a, it's not affordable for me, you know, and I'm a grown woman. I'm a grown woman with a job. So, um, yeah, how, no, of how, course. you know, like it, it just wasn't affordable. I mean, as, as good as it is, and I heard the reviews on it. It's just like, where's the modesty in that? We're, like, that's not modesty to us. Modesty needs to be throughout fashion. You can't just, it's beyond clothing. And that's, the, that's our, um, my, um, I, lo, what, um, sorry, what's it called? With the slogan for, for the agency is, I'm a model's modesty beyond fashion. Sorry, modesty beyond clothing. And that's what it is. It's beyond the clothing. It's the physical, the internal, the, the way we spend our money, it has to be modest for it to be part of that that, that realm. Well, yeah. I think it's also a big thing of like, also, you know, like to be empowered. Uh, yeah. Clothing for me is, again, I tell my grandmother how she dressed us, but it was an empowerment, you know, and, you know, gender for me is also part of the diversity, it's queerness. And, you know, I want to wear a skirt. I want to wear a dress. I don't care about what people call me out. In the beginning, it was difficult. I felt like people would say, Brendan, you're a sissy. You're like, and I'm like, at this point, when I wear a skirt, I feel so valued. I feel so strong. I will walk differently. And that's part of it, you know? And I think that's something as well. Like, you know, why do we have these gendered clothing styles like you know or colors or things you know we have built binaries and for me i don't follow them like you know i'm not into it like i will you know i'm very like who i am you meet me and i will be wearing like something i'm wearing a pair of shorts right now that look like a skirt um but like it doesn't matter to me but why is that a part of that culture um you know so i i, I just think about also the fractures that fashion can create through gender. I think that's quite interesting because we have my husband, for instance, wearing um, Islamic clothing, and that would be a phobe that he would wear. Um, for people that are not aware what a phobe is, it's um, a one-piece garment for a male. Um, and yeah, it's, it like literally goes over the head. You can have mm -hmm. ones that zip up, but it, to look at it, you might say that was a dress that he was wearing. Um, but then it's it's a cultural clothing, it's a religious garment, and there's um, not really a gender to it. So I, I kind of get that. It's it's quite strange. Whereas a woman wouldn't wear a phobe, um, within a Muslim woman wouldn't wear a phobe because we are within our religion kind of told that there are certain genders wear this and certain genders wear that. So where do we differ there? However, when we actually look at the clothing, um, the the West may call what the male clothing is um, 
feminine clothing, you know, like I said, the foam. They might be like, why is that man wearing a dress? Or we have the Somali community and they have, oh, I'm going to butcher the word, but I'm sorry for anyone that's Somali that's okay. listening. Um, they have a male type of skirt um, that they wear traditionally, religiously. Um, I, I can't pronounce the word, so I'm, I'm really sorry, but people are going to be screaming at the screen and, and everything. Um, but that, again, the West will look at that as, um, you know, a skirt, but it's not. It's a cultural clothing for where they wear in the world and how, how the fashion is um, sustainable for their lifestyle that they lived, the arid weather and so on and so forth. So, yeah, like you wearing a skirt, Brendan, if that makes you feel liberated, then then why not? Of course. And yeah, I think also through like, you know, my cultural like heritage of being Indian, Kenyan, you know, like we have different kinds of clothing, but then it's also about the idea like why does, you know, a Western kilt get given an, a, an allowance? Yeah, that's so true. But then why am I wearing something as a POC queer and then I'm called a sissy or something else, you know, there's there are those things, that, you know, so I think there's a difference allowance in certain spaces. And also like, you know, how did certain like patterns or like, you know, in Scottish culture, like the Paisley is an African Indian hybrid design. And how did that become called Paisley? Because it's a, it was taken from some, from, from our cultures and then made into, you know, a culture that is westernized. Paisley is a space in, in um, you know, Scotland, you know? And so again, it's like the idea of like looking down on, on, on queerness, on POCs, and like the idea of understanding what we are trying to do. And I think this is why, again, it's important that we're in the space. Right. And right I now. And you both are, I mean, you both went right through the misappropriation segment and I love that. I appreciate that from the bottom of my heart and, and moving into the last, um, we're starting to get uh, one or two Q&As. I have one here and I think this kind of um, settles in um, a little bit with, with my question also about how, wanting to know how both of you are using your spaces um, to reclaim um, reclaim really your power, reclaim power that you, that, that, that was systemically kind of oppressed um, for obviously many generations. I'm curious, um, and I'm sure the audience would love to know a little bit more about both of your roles, you know, as an artist, as an owner of, a, of an agency, um, as well as uh, here we have a question you know, uh, asking, well, I mean, where can I educate myself about mo uh, modest fashion and what's acceptable? Um, but I don't believe that that, I don't, I don't feel like that should be put on you specifically. I feel also to answer that person's question, Google. I mean, like we have to start, you know, educating yourself is also to call also doing the work, uh, you know, um, but but also in a way answering that question, I think that um, answering that question with my question, how are both of you um, using your work to reclaim that power um, and reclaim power for others who are from your community um, in order to um, educate people about who you are? Um, yeah. Shani? Okay, so... Um I thought I could do that by starting a, a modest fashion agency. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not the first agency to be um, around for Muslim women. There was one um, that started in 2014 by a lady in New York. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what happened there with her continuing that. So perhaps she hit the hurdles that I have hit as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'll say there's hurdles there because, you know, we're, we're trying to pave this way and trying to lay something down. But when you're a small company or a small entity within this huge mainstream fashion industry, they often just take what you're doing and run with it. So I've had a lot of, um, you know, poaching of models, a lot of, um, 
you know, just copying of things that we're doing. And that's fine, you know, like originality is not really around anymore. So that's perfectly fine. But what is the problem is when it's going too fast for um, for what it actually is without the definition, as I mentioned earlier on. So one thing that I've decided that I'm going to be doing, God willing, is actually changing the space that I'm working within. Um, I no longer really want to have an agency, even though I feel my agency is very important in protecting women um, within this space. Um, I feel like that's no longer really needed. It's more about having the definition of the space. And with the experience that I have, I, I would say in the modest fashion industry, I'm one of the leaders who had the most experience being that we started the agency in 2017 um, and obviously I've been running it and trying to work with everything um, and tweak things here and there and see and downfalls, ups and downs, all this kind of stuff. So I feel now it's really important to try and make a space, make a definition of what modest fashion is. Um, and that's the broader modest fashion because we do, we do encompass Christian women within our agency, mm -hmm. um, women with no religion um, or don't, don't really assign to religion, just women that, do not want to be over sexualized when it comes to modeling that do not want to take their clothes off that want to be able to you know just have their personal beliefs and and be safe in the, in the, in the space of modeling so i think um the the best way that we can do that is um to yeah is, is to change what we're doing we have to change and evolve with the times we have to um the mainstream has to as well um and I would like to say they're slowly getting there, but they're really not. <laughs> so I just feel like this is needs to be the focus now. Um, instead of having the agency that I have, um, be more around about trying to create a platform for modest fashion and define it. So, yeah. Great. And Thank think you. even to that point, you know, creating spectrums, you know, and understanding the spectrums of what is, you know, and I think for both, of the respective, you know, the queer in the modest fashion communities, like understanding there's a spectrum and researching it and really kind of taking purposeful action to understand those nuances, uh, to create those spaces for them so that people can feel seen and heard and not feel that sense of, opp feel oppressed or be oppressed, not even feel, but actually be oppressed. Um, and Brendan, I pose the same question to you as well. Yeah, and for me, you know, fashion, again, is empowerment. It's a space of understanding one's sense of body in a sense of like, you know, like how do I give myself empowerment to walk a certain way, to believe a certain way? And I think that's why Willie Smith for me was like, he gave our community, he gave our community of people of color a space to see ourselves in another place. And there's a weird moment when I was watching Pose and this, the kids on Pose were like, I'm going to mock Willie Smith from like Saks or Saks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was something I remember going, like, oh, okay, you're bringing it back. Because like, again, we needed to be there. We want to be there. And in that space, we, you know, Willie did it. He went there. He went there. We didn't need to mop the stores. Like, you know, we needed to like have a sense of, being like we are valuable and so fashion for me gives me empowerment and within that like you know in my work as an artist i will always work with designers and to make like you know uniforms as i call them or because i want my my dancers to also feel empowered um, but i also think that the industry needs to change up, of course and within the change of the industry you know we need to have different diversity you know hybridity queerness you know, like body types, class, you know, visibility. Like, you know, I want to feel visible, but my biggest thing is I want to feel invisible. I don't want someone to say like, Brendan, you are this person because of this. And that's why you're in this show or why, why you're doing this. I don't want people to say that about me. I want to be invisible. You know, right now I want to be heard, I want to be seen, but my goal is to be invisible because I don't need to be doing this work all the time. Our work is not done. We're still working. And that's for me, 
is how fashion can also change it. You know, like so I, in my in my new pieces, I'm using camouflage within different textiles to change the way that we see people that or not see somebody. Um, because I'm really thinking about this space of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. Thank you both so much. I really do appreciate uh, you both just opening your hearts out and being just honest and, and raw and real and true. And, um, and it's what, I've, what I hoped for. Um, so I really appreciate you, both of you just um, putting it out there on the table as it is and as it should be so that people can hear and listen and have this as a repository that they can always look back and always have that so, so that they always see that it's been said, you know, that it, that it, that it wasn't pushed under the rug. So I want to thank you both, Brendan and Shandy. Shandy, I, I thank you. Thank y'all so much. And thank y'all out there for tuning in. Um, and next up, we will be in uh, over there in the keynote uh, with LaRoche. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh.